Okay, good morning. Welcome to the Committee on Contracts, Fiscal 2020 Preliminary Budget Hearing. I'm Justin Brandon, Chair of the Contracts Committee. Uh, this morning we'll be reviewing the proposed FY 2020 budget for the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, or MOX. Uh, I want to welcome Director Daniel Simon of MOX and thank you uh, for testifying before the committee. Today uh, we'll be assessing MOX's programs and activities, including their continued work in optimizing the procurement process, reporting on the city's procurement performance through the Agency Procurement Indicators Report and various other responsibilities that maintain the integrity of procurement throughout the City of New York. The Mayor's Fiscal 2020 Preliminary Budget for MOX is 29 million, which includes 17.5 million in personal service funding uh, to support 203 budgeted full-time positions. This funding is primarily allocated towards reporting on and evaluating the City's procurement activity as well as taking uh, measures to facilitate and optimize the procurement process within the City of New York. In a few minutes, we'll hear more from Mox on their specific goals for FY 2020. In our discussion uh, with Mox this morning, I hope to explore different areas of the City's contract budget in order to gain a greater clarity and understanding regarding where and how money is being spent to add capacity to the City's procurement processes and evaluation. I look forward to hearing more from Mox regarding its achievements in procurement reform, in particular the progress related to Passport over the past year and what we can expect from Passport over the next year. Additionally, I'd like to hear the office speak to any citywide procurement trends related to cost overruns, MWBE utilization, and cycle time. Lastly, I'd like to begin a discussion today to identify any challenges the agency is facing in filling staff vacancies as well as what more we can expect from MOX once the agency reaches full or near full staff capacity. After we hear from MOX, uh, council members will have a chance to follow up with questions for the director. Following that, members of the public will have an opportunity to provide testimony. I hope the director or members of the staff will, will stay to hear the public testimonies, which is often the most important part of the hearing. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Councilwoman Helen Rosenthal, thank you. Uh, before I turn the floor over to the administration, I want to thank my committee staff, Policy Analyst K Casey Addison, Legislative Council Alex Polinoff, Financial Analyst uh, Andrew Wilbur, and Finance Unit Head John Russell, as well as my Senior Advisor Jonathan Yedin for all their hard work in putting this hearing together today, and I'll turn it over now to uh, my legislative counsel, Alex, to swear you guys in. Would you all please raise your right hands? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You may begin. Good morning, Chair Brandon and members of the Contracts Committee. My name is Dan Simon. I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services and the city's chief procurement officer. Thank you for inviting me to update you on how MOX is resourced to advance New York City's procurement priorities. As you know, MOX is, MOX is focused on reducing frustrating administrative burdens experienced today and establishing game-changing technology-enabled processes to strengthen collaboration, increase transparency, and speed procurement. MOX drives adoption of newer practices to leverage best-in-class technology, so our service offerings are necessarily hands-on, tailored to various audiences, and designed to be scaled for our workforce. The fiscal year 2020 preliminary budget provides MOX $29 million, including $17.5 million for personal services to support 203 full-time positions and $11.5 million in other than personal services funding. Across the five-year plan window, the agency's budget peaks in fiscal year 2019 and levels off to a baseline of $24.3 million, while our budgeted headcount remains relatively flat. The recent increase in MOX's budget results from the administrative transfer of the Passport Project contract from the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications to MOX. DOIT remains a critical partner on all of our technology-related initiatives. Over the past year, we have continued our progress toward ensuring fairness in the procurement process. As part of these efforts, we continue to grow and adjust our organizational framework at the same time. As of today, there are 169 active employees across two office locations, 
a 17% increase from last year's 145 active employees. And last fall, we moved staff from our down, uh, office in downtown Brooklyn to a new space blocks away from our headquarters in Lower Manhattan. As we have grown, we have implemented several internal workforce development programs, such as a mentoring program and a lunch and learn series. While we continue with our traditional tasks and responsibilities and simultaneously transform a major city business process, it is critical that MOX is an agency that evolves with the changing dynamics of procurement as a whole. These activities also shape our ongoing work to deepen and enhance workforce development offerings for our agency clients. We are already seeing results based on our double-pronged efforts with our team capitalizing on every opportunity to make improvements and build on promising practices. Here are a few examples of recent progress, even with the full transformation in development. Jointly crafted and implemented a 25% advance policy, which resulted in $1.3 billion dispersed in fiscal year 19, putting money in the hands of nonprofit providers more quickly. Released the City of New York Health and Human Services Cost Policies and Procedures Manual that sets forth new claiming procedures, standardized definitions, and established updated indirect cost rate policies, creating clearer guidance and increasing flexibility for nonprofits. Maintained a six-day review for invoices managed in HHS Accelerator, enabled by use of a standard, standardized budget format, streamlined workflow, and a shared digital workspace for agencies and vendors to remedy issues. And codified a new PPB rule, which enables agencies a larger discretionary purchasing threshold for goods and services exclusively from city-certified MWBEs, resulting in over $60 million in purchases. These results moved the needle and were achieved through partnerships with vendors and city agencies. But we know that significant challenges remain, particularly in human services. The investments made by this administration of roughly $600 million per year in the human services se se sector has created a massive amount of contract amendments. Due to diligent work by city agencies and nonprofits, the vast majority of these am amendments are now registered. In collaboration with Deputy Mayor Palacio's office, OMB, and MOX, agencies are in the process of a surge on the remainder. The city is focused on timely registration, and we have established new accountability structures to ensure active monitoring of milestones towards submission of registration packages to the controller's office. Additionally, we implemented, we implemented standardized project management guidelines for agencies renewing or extending contracts each year. We are, we are always working to capture actionable lessons from vendors in all sectors. Our public-facing help desk has fielded over 50,000 service tickets from vendors and agencies since the launch of Passport in August 2017. The ch this channel is vital for operations and essential for documenting the experiences of vendors, leading to the creation of system enhancements and new policies for agencies. Proactive vendor engagement re remains a critical priority as we develop Passport Release 3. We look forward to continuing our par partnership with sector leaders and building on the collaborative models we have established. Our investment in Passport has already helped speed processes and relieve administrative burdens. Since going live, 11,489 vendors have completed the online disclos disclosure process in Passport, transforming what was formerly a paper-based Vendex process that could take some vendors weeks, if not months, to complete. City agencies have completed 11,337 responsibility determinations in Passport. A process that would typically take six to seven weeks is now taking seven days on average because Passport allows agencies to share information collected on vendors for, vendor, for, for responsibility determinations. While we, can <clears throat> while we continue to plan for and develop new system releases, our office constantly monitors the system's performance and takes feedback from end users to prioritize enhancements between major releases. For example, we built an integration with the Department of Finance's internal tax check system, allowing Passport to bring back a vendor's tax status. We have also added a one-year validity period to DOF's tax determination, removing the need for DOF to conduct a duplicative vendor review. The decrease in cycle time for a key pre-registration agency activity provides a glimpse of what can be achieved as we stand up new Passport functionality. Better management and oversight will also be reinforced by real-time status updates for user tasks, transparent views of process workflows, and use of system-generated performance reports. We will build on the success of Release 1 in a few weeks by launching Release 2 in partnership with the Department of Citywide Administrative Services and do it. This release will make agency operations easier and purchasing more strategic, helping roughly 3,000 city staff streamline management of requests, orders, receipts, 
and invoices for city requirements contracts. Our office is committed to realizing our vision of fair, responsible, and timely procurement, and this will be achieved through standardization, automation, and radical transparency. We remain committed to collaborating with citywide and agency policymakers to implement new strategies which ease the administrative hardships faced by city vendors, particularly nonprofits, small businesses, and MWBEs. We are excited with the progress we've made thus far in the design of Release 3 of Passport and invite all members of this committee to actively participate in this process. At this time, we believe that we are appropriately resourced and have great partners at the Office of Management and Budget who will ensure that we are sufficiently positioned to respond to any emerging needs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I am joined by Jeremy Halbridge, Deputy Director of Administration, Victor Olds, General Counsel, and Danielle Lewis, Associate Director for Finance and Operations. We're happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you. Um, I definitely felt a palpable rumbling of excitement this morning on the way into the city of people excited for Passport. Um, it's hard to contain. Yeah, yeah, it, was, it wasn't the R train, it was. Um, um, phase two, will it be rolled out and fully operational before the end of this month? Before the end of March, likely not. Uh, we were on target for March, but uh, we need a few more weeks of testing. Okay. Um, and has MOX determined the key performance indicators for phase two? So there'll be, there'll be lots of uh, indicators of success uh, around release two, certainly around speed of uh, ordering and receipts uh, and invoices for sure. Um, I mean, happy to look into what indicators you might want to see. Um, uh, there'll be a whole uh, robust, robust data set. But again, these are requirements contracts at DCAS and do it, not uh, related particularly to the procurement process uh, as we've spoke about before. I want to acknowledge uh, my colleague, Councilman Perkins, has joined us as well. Um, getting into the contract for Passport itself, uh, the total is $45 million, uh, of which we are told a little more than $28 million has been spent to date. Um, I guess first question and concern is do we anticipate completing the project within the parameters of the $45 million? The, the current scope, for sure, yes. So the original contract was for $30 million. We had then an amendment for roughly $15 million. Um, that added invoicing to the, to the project as well as incorporating DOE uh, into all phases of the project. And what, I mean, why do we think it's so expensive? I mean, I was like, I mean, I'm look, I, I was doing some research into like apps and stuff, right? And I mean, obviously I know Passport is not an app that I'm gonna use on my phone, although maybe it should be, um, but I know that, and, and maybe you know, one day we'd want it to be, but I know that um, what I found was the average cost to make an app ranges from about $80,000 to $250,000, depending on what type of app you want to create. So a simple app would cost about $80,000. Basic database apps cost between one hundred dollars and $150,000. Advanced multi-feature apps cost one hundred and fifty dollars to $250,000. Finally, more complex apps will cost six figures but can push up over 1.5 million. So let's add another two million for updates and marketing and salaries and all that other stuff. And we're still a couple of galaxies away from 45 million. So why do we think it's so expensive? I mean, I think that's a little bit of a, a, an apples sure. and oranges comparison. Okay, because, but there's um, still an insane gap there. Yeah, I, I, I would say that Passport's uh, model of software as a service, so this is not a, we're not building a, a system from scratch, this is not custom code that we're building, we've purchased a, a, a procure, an e-procurement platform, that is iValua, that is what the-, the but Wouldn't that make it cheaper? Well, it makes it cheaper than doing a custom application. I think the, the procurement process is so uh, complex in the city of New York, sure. it doesn't lend itself to a simple app where you're you know, calling a specific data set to bring onto your phone the results that you want or do some 
you know, minor transactions that you might do on an app. This is, this is uh, you know, at a, on a scale far larger than anything that an app could handle. Could we in the future have a mobile version of Passport to, to be able to look at reports or do some simple transactional type tasks? Sure, we definitely could look into that. Um, but right now, what we're focused on is uh, providing, as you know, a full end-to-end -end, uh, system that covers yeah. the entire procurement process, and we think that the price that we got for this system is very competitive. Uh, what is it competitive in comparison to what? Well, to a, one, to a custom application for one, um, you know, having to code from, you know, from scratch an entire uh, procurement system. Uh, you know, we, Accelerator was a, a custom application, didn't even cover uh, the entire procurement process um, and cost somewhere in the range. I don't have the dollars on, on the, the cost of Accelerator, but it was, you know, something analogous to what we have uh, mm -hmm. doing the full end-to-end uh, -end process. So the, the bulk of the money being paid to um, uh, the contractor is purposed for what? So we're, we're buying this platform, right? Um, the, the, the beauty of the platform is, is, is very con it's highly configurable. And so it's got a strong code base and an out-of-the-box functionality for e-procurement. But this, the New York City, as you know, has tons of laws and regulations that any municipality has got to, that has uh, in, in play. Um, and so we have to configure uh, the system to meet the city's needs, right? Right. Straight, straight, the private sector does procurement very differently than the public sector does. Um, and so all of this time is spent designing building, testing the city's version of the iValue of product. We want to stay as close as we possibly can to what's straight out of the box, but that's not always possible in a system as complex as New York. Um, would you be able to provide the committee with an itemized breakdown of, of the, the 28 million that's been spent so far? Of course. Okay. Um, I'd just be interested to see where, where it all goes. Um, um, so the citywide savings program includes 90 million in savings from procurement reform beginning uh, FY19 to, through FY21. How was this, the, the, the figure, the, sa the cost savings figure determined? So uh, we are partnering with OMB on those kinds of discussions. To be frank though, uh, MOX's focus is on delivering the system and the implementation of the system. Um, there are some obvious benefits that we uh, that the system will provide for sure, um, but we're not focused necessarily on dollar savings or cost avoidance. Um, happy to you know talk more about that, but uh, you know OMB is focused on those uh, those particular savings. Right. We know there will be savings, but we are laser focused on implementing the system and providing all the tools and benefits that it will bring. So I, I guess one thing I've been thinking about is I understand how Passport is going to hopefully um, do make great strides in, in, in transparency and seeing the process and you know maybe even vindicating the administration a bit on delays and whatnot, as you've mentioned. But how and and is Passport being designed or how will Passport lead to cost savings? Like aside from seeing dysfunction and pulling back the curtain, how will it lead to saving money? Well, again, I would go back to these discussions are better had with uh, us and OMB together, um, perhaps offline uh, in a separate meeting, um, but some of them are clear, right? Like just removing paper out of the procurement process is, is a savings on both sides, the city sure. and vendors, right? That's just one obvious uh, savings. Time saves money. The, 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 less, the less time you have spent on a procurement process obviously saves uh, the city some type of cost. Um, so the, there's a variety of different uh, places where we could uh, save time. That's, that's the whole goal here is to, is to you know, take a circuitous and complex process and make it more streamlined, thereby going faster. That, that leads to obvious savings. Okay. Um. Let me see. I, oh, I wanted to ask about some of the headcount uh, issues. So as of February, correct me if I'm wrong, Mox had 
35, 34 uh, staff vacancies. So why did Mox add 11 staff positions to, it bu to its budget when it is currently looking for 34 people? So we have a variety of new needs, one of which um, uh, the, the 11 that you're talking about are to uh, resource Mox's internal operations. Um, so over the last few years, Mox has gone from a very small office um, before Accelerator and Passport were managed there into you know, a, a sort of very small, but a sort of having its own discrete agency operations. And so we now need things like an IT help desk um, for our own internal staff. We need an HR department. We need to be able to um, have a, a, a finance shop to support you know, a, a budget hearing. Um, and so it's those lines that were dedicated to supporting the administration of MOX. And how old is MOX now? Well, MOX was uh, uh, established after the Board of Estimate was uh, abolished back in, I'll get the year up yeah, wrong, yeah. but you know, it, it's been quite a, quite a long time now. But I think the, the evolution of MOX very recently is where the growth happened when we, uh, when MOX and HHS Accelerator first merged in right. 2016, and then the Passport Project was, uh, got its footing and is, is growing. But again, uh, yeah, so, so that, that's the evolution of where MOX uh, is today over the past few years. Yeah, I mean, the stuff you mentioned certainly sounds critical. It's just crazy, and, and I don't blame you, but it's crazy that it's been around since the, the demise of the Board of Estimates and we're still hiring some of those, or yeah, looking for those positions. But, but, but back then, um, Mox was more centrally uh, connected to the mayor's office and City Hall, right? Now we've spun off into an, an agency, and so we now need those operations for the first time, those 11 uh, administrative heads. Right. Th that's, a, that's a fairly new development. Um. Is, did, did the, the office space capacity play a, a role in the inability to hire to full capacity? It hasn't, it hasn't been a, a major impact. Um, space is something that we're, you know, <laughs> unfortunately uh, always focused on. Um, but it, didn't, it hasn't played a role in, whether, in our ability to hire. The biggest impact on our ability to hire is the fact that we have a lot of technology positions. There's tons of turnover in that space. It's hard for government to compete with the private sector. Um, and we're also looking for a particular type of technology uh, uh, staff person. Um, it's not just you know someone who's got good that that uh, you know a strong ETL developer um, or someone who knows SQL. It's also someone who's civic-minded, who gets what we're trying to do, who is willing to take part in a citywide project that you know frankly has you burning at sometimes at 100% and sometimes 300% mm. throughout the course of a project we're looking for those special kind of people and you know it's it's been tough recruiting we have added oh, close to 30 people in the past uh, 12 months um, but particularly in technology um, it's it's a struggle to recruit those are hard to recruit positions but we're you know we have all of our postings out or a good portion of our postings out and we're we're diligently recruiting Okay, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague for some questions. I have to go take a vote in the other room, but uh, Councilwoman Rosenthal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, just along those lines, are you, is MOX under the freeze that every other agency is others under? So if you have people who you want to hire, are you given the authority to hire them? So we're under the same uh, uh, guidelines uh, from OMB that other agencies are, yes. So that's a no, you're not allowed to hire them? Well, we work with OMB, we have a clear peg target. There is a, there is a hiring freeze that has been issued, and so we work with OMB to raise our needs, and we work with them on a case-by-case -case basis to figure out what the, what the next steps are. Is the lack of hiring um, causing any slowdown in rollout of Passport? Right now we have the resources we need to get the project done. Okay, um, I'm wondering if you, I'm gonna go to a different line of questioning now. Um, 
have there been any slowdowns for you in getting your contract for Passport rolled out in terms of getting it through the morass that is bureaucracy or through the controller's office? Have you been able to let your contracts uh, get implemented in time? Well, so uh, the, the original contract was let by do it and transferred over to MOX, um, but that went through a process that was probably more painful than it should be. Um, and, and with all parties agreeing on the transfer, there, there are some certain sort of tasks and system related activity that have to go on to do that. Um, with, you know, when you have an amendment, typically um, it, it is late, right? An amendment is you've identified a, uh, a condition uh, in the performance of that contract that needs to change in some way, shape, or form. Maybe you're adding scope or the conditions that you expected to meet were slightly different and so now we have to change the scope of that contract. Um, but those things are, tend to be retroactive because what you, you want to change the condition of the performance on that contract immediately. You don't have to, you don't have to wait for the procurement process to play out to start. I, 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 but to All answer your question, to say perhaps the vendor gets paid late because the the change is not registered for right. some time. Okay, that's right. Um, if you, I want to talk about. It looks like you've made some distance on page of your testimony. On page five of your testimony, you talk about um, the Department of Finance's internal tax check system. And it struck me that that was an example of sort of unwinding the ball of string that is the bureaucracy of procurement. Um, have you found in going through building a passport that you now can identify the actual steps that are necessary to have procurement happen? And have you identified other areas where there are um, steps that are necessary that perhaps could happen at the same time and don't have to be um, sequential, but in, in fact could be happening at the same time? Absolutely. So the Department of Finance is one good example. It's not something that we went live with with release one. Um, and so it was a sort of a swivel chair over the Department of Finance and, and bringing back that information or a separate task that kept getting sent to the Department of Finance. They're working in their system instead of having the information automated in ours. And we recognize, all right, we need to build an interface between our system and the DOF system so that there isn't this swivel chair activity, which does take time. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that, that, that's a great example of what we're able to do on the fly and uh, in between major releases. We didn't have to wait for a release two in order to integrate that. We were able to do that within uh, called dot releases, so 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1 1.3. 1 One thing I like to, when I'm trying to describe procurement and help people keep their eyes open, I mean, definitely talk about a ball of string, but also that it's like a game of shoots and ladders, and that a lot of times you're, what we're trying to do to fix procurement is to create more shoots and more ladders and have the shoots move the ball forward rather than yes. you know, back like in a game of sorry. If I were to ask you to lay out the steps of procurement, and, and this is why of course it's so vast, but for every single agency, and I'm sure it's different for different agencies, sort of what the procurement steps are, could you do that? Is sure. that part of the manual of passport? So it's definitely part of the discovery work that we've been doing for a number of years. We have it laid out. Um, we're happy to show that to you. I think that'd be great for the committee to see. Would love that. Um, and will passport, or in doing the exercise that you've been doing, has it allowed you to identify some agencies that perhaps, for lack of a better term, do procurement better than other agencies to do the exact same work. For example, procurement in, you know, the agency A 
is able to do, you know, getting a wall fixed better than agency B, and perhaps we should use the procurement mechanism that agency A uses for all other agencies. So in general, everyone follows the same rule book. Everyone is following the PPB rules, so there isn't too much variation agency to agency. Um, but at a, at a very micro level, on a best practice level, what we're trying to do, we have a, we, so we have a steering committee made up of a, a dozen agencies or so, um, and we have at the staff level, at the senior staff level, we have a liaison group that we work with on a re very regular basis, and we're constantly pulling out the best practices at these agencies to ensure that we're thinking about what they do well um, and incorporate that into the passport design. Um, to the extent that it that it makes sense, I don't know that there's any one agency that does any large amount of no, work no, no, no. better than micro. others. But at a, at a micro level, there are definitely best practices that we've identified uh, working with agencies. Um, one of the things I looked at a number of years ago was how many people were trained in accelerator from the agency perspective, mm -hmm. and you would always uh, Mox always knew well there are these many workers and these many workers have been trained and these many workers come back and retrain, which is perfectly normal. How would you say you're doing in terms of training agency staff for being able to use Passport? So I, 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 if, if you're looking for a number, I just don't have, happen to have that number on me right now. Um, I would say that training is, uh, I, I feel good about where we are in terms of change management and learning management. Um, and that's, uh, that, is a, another, that is a pillar of what we do. So yes, we're developing, uh, we're maintaining Accelerator, we're building, developing, and maintaining Passport, and that is a critical part of our work. Equally important, if not more important, is ensuring that the users of these systems know what to do when they get there. Um, and that is not, you know, that we don't have a certificate program where you go through training and then you're good, right? This is a constant engagement with vendors, agencies, staff, executive, uh, and mid-range, and, and the users of the system. And it's also about timing that correctly. If we train somebody today sure. and they don't use the system for six months, they're going to forget what we said. And so it's hitting Do those. Do you have those manuals that you regularly update? Without a doubt, yes. And in different modalities. We have videos. We have job aids for particular small amounts of work. There are some users that don't have uh, you know, a full set of tasks in the system, but one unique task. And so we have particular guides uh, on, on those various tasks. I'm sure tasks. the committee staff will follow up with okay. you on that. You mentioned that you're incorporating DOE into Passport, um, and that was one of the change in scope orders yes. that cost $15 million. Well, it, it was that and also adding invoicing, which is a huge part oh, of yeah, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there any thought to including NYCHA, H and H, and the SCA? Um, we have not. It, we have not contemplated those things. Um, frankly, we have plenty to do over the next uh, 13 months to get release three live, um, and we've got a, a, a solid scope that we're focused on. Um, if the benefits are there and other uh, entities see those benefits, of, of course we'd entertain them. Um, but we haven't had any discussions with those, with those entities at this point. Um, in, again, on page five, you mentioned that you've uploaded about 11,500 vendors. How many more to go? So that's, it's leveled off um, uh, since, since go live back in August of 2017. We were at a, a really fast rate there for a while and it's leveled off. It's tough to know. Um, what the what the the ceiling is on the number of vendors okay. in New York All City? Right. Good enough. Um, but we think that the folks that do business with the city currently um, are there and doing the tasks they need to do. Um, and what we're focused on is as we are lowering the sort of administrative burden of doing business with the city, that we're making sure that we're getting out to other vendor communities that aren't yet there. Do you coordinate with SBS to make sure all of the certified MWBEs are in there? Yes. You do? We, we, co we talk with SBS all the time, um, and to the extent that they are uh, in Passport uh, is, is a work in progress. Um, and I so, 
that would be interesting to come back with the, to the committee about number certified, which is around, I forget, 9,000, and how many are in, can work in passport. Yep. I would think we'd want to regularly know that. Um, how large is the returnable grant fund? Uh, right now it is, it is roughly $70 million. Seven zero. Seven zero. And how, what percent is on loan? Is out right at this moment. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I can get back to you with an exact. Or a number. Uh, roughly, I think there's about 50 loans out. And Fifty roughly, million dollars worth of loans out and out. twenty available and twenty available. That's rough does, order of magnitude. That's fine. I'm not going to hold you to it. How often does that number get down to zero in terms of amount available? It's no, to my knowledge, it's never been down to zero. Um, it has it has gone down further than it is now uh, with the available amount. Um, but uh, and and that's typically around the turn of the fiscal year when we have lots and lots of contracts uh, being registered and we're trying to bridge that gap for nonprofits, um, but it's never been down to zero. There's never been no money available for lending. What? Say that last sentence again? Never been no money available for lending. It's never gone down to zero. Uh-huh. But surely, I think it would be worth looking at that and seeing whether or not, I've heard from providers that they try to access the returnable grant fund, and they're told that money is not available. So perhaps you're, you know, you know, keeping a lot of balls in the air That's and trying to make sure that there's always some money available for the most urgent request. But I think there are urgent requests, perhaps not the most urgent requests for money from the returnable grant fund that's not going out. Sure. So, so there, there are situations where the, the funding available does not meet the current need at that very particular moment, and we have to be careful that we may not grant a full request to a vendor. If they're asking for $10, we may only grant them seven and have them you know, come back for the other three in a few weeks, right? Those things happen a all the time. A thousand percent, and that's exactly what I'm getting at. I'd like to, I think the committee would be very interested in knowing the dollar value of that three million all the, in all the situations, yeah. because from my perspective, you know, the human service contracts are hanging on by a thread, and they could use that other three dollars. Okay. Is follow that possible? Up. To follow up with the committee, of course. Well, I mean, is it possible to figure out that math? Uh, it, it would it would take some effort, um, but we can we can look at the loan application versus what was actually loaned out. Sure. Um. Okay, and um, uh, the obvious follow up question is: I'd be interested in knowing. Um, whether or not the administration would be willing to increase the size of the fund by that amount. Do you think that the administration thinks about the fund as a timing dollar value, or does it think about it as extra money the city has to pay? Well, it's certainly not extra money, right? Because the money would... If, and if so to that extent, do you think an argument could be made to double the size because it's simply a timing issue? Uh, we can we can come back and, and and talk more about whether or not that's a priority. But as I said, you know there is a lot of funding available right now for for loans that would be issued. If you have a particular case where someone feels like it's they're being told the wrong information, then I want to follow up on those specific sure, cases. Sure, I appreciate that, but it's not a mem num mem blah. it's not an issue of a particular member knowing about a particular nonprofit. It's, an, it's a matter of culture and messaging. And if the culture and messaging is not available now, come back in three weeks, and you're running a nonprofit and you have eight billion things to do, you don't come back in three weeks, you end up having to take a loan out from a bank mm -hmm. at 8%. So I, it's a matter, I, I have heard that answer for a long time and it's really not sufficient. And I would urge you to urge the administration, since this is only a timing issue, to push hard to 
increase it by, I don't care what dollar value because it's a timing issue, right? It shouldn't, if people understand what the returnable grant fund is, they should understand that the money always comes back. And this is simply a fund that allows timing to play out. Does that make sense? I understand what you're saying, yes. Do you think the administration understands what I'm saying? Well, Do you think happy, OMB happy to take understands that back and talk it? More about it? Okay. And then I, I do, Chair, if, if I could beg your indulgence, have a few more questions. Um, you mentioned somewhere, or the chair mentioned, that there's 90, nine zero, 90 million in the budget for procurement savings. Is that accurate? So I don't have those numbers in front of me. It's a, it's a targeted savings for procurement reform citywide. It's a citywide target, target, not a MOX target. Right. I think what I'd be, I think the committee might be interested in seeing is over the last four years, what were the targeted savings in the budget every year? You don't even have to come back with whether or not they were achieved because I understand how completely amorphous that number is, but just what were the targeted savings every year? And the reason this is important is because um, in my, I forget, second or third year. So I guess the question is, during the life of the de Blasio administration, what were the targeted savings put in the budget budget every year? That's, that's all. Do, it, does that make sense? I understand the request. We can go back to OMB and, and talk OMB, about it. OMB, I mean, back. it's just a matter of pulling up the preliminary budget or November plan, whatever thing it was put in. Okay, we'll follow up. Right-sizing human service contracts. Um, you know, we've put so much money in the budget to right-size, and um, I think it's about 150 million in total. And of course, the issue is modifying the contracts to get that money to the providers. Um, do you believe that all of the modifications have gone out so that all the agencies have indeed received that cumulative, you know, the, sorry, contracted nonprofits have received the total number that's been, put, the total amount of money that's been put in the budget, has that now funneled to the nonprofit agencies doing the work? So there will always be amendments in the pipeline. That will never get to zero, right? Because we're constantly amending contracts, in particular the ones you're talking about where it's the uh, raising the minimum wage, the cost of living adjustments, the indirect rate, and other enhancements, the model budget exercises. So all of those, all of those investments in the nonprofit sector and human services contracts have all resulted in contract amendments. Um, and so I would say the uh, large majority, vast majority, um, have been have made their way into uh, vendors' contract to providers' contracts. Um, the mayor has recognized that this is an issue for nonprofits, has committed to clearing the backlog um, by May, and we are, we are focused on getting those, the, the remainder of those uh, amendments. Um, I had not heard door. that. So that's good information to know. So the mayor's committed, which means you've suggested to the mayor that this is a possibility, to clear the backlog by May of 2019, mm -hmm. that all of those amended contracts will have circulated through the system and at least landed on the controller's desk for registration. That's the goal, yes. Again, the, the number of amendments out there will never get to zero because there are always amendments in the pipeline, but, it, but getting, getting, there's a last sort of, not a last, but a, a surge of getting those retroactive amendments out the door and into uh, providers' hands through I understand the phrase. I think we need to separate out two thoughts. Sure. Of course, there will always be amendments because in life we're always changing scope. But I don't think it's true that these amendments will last forever. I do, I think you're just talking about two separate things. Is that possible? Well, because if you're, um, there are four specific things that money has put, been put in to the budget for, a minimum wage. Well, once that is put in, it's baselined. You don't, unless you're saying you have to amend the contract every year for minimum wage. No. 
Yeah, it, so again, it's the, we, if for contracts that um, started back then, we were able to amend in a multi-year fashion, right? You're only doing it once um, and then and it's done. Um, but based on timing, there was raising the minimum wage. Then there, there were also uh, COLA exercises. There were also the investment in indirect. And so all, I, all I'm saying is I'm not is doubting that, it's complicated, yeah. but at some point it comes to an end. Well, yes, but there are model budget discussions going on right now. Good. Right? And so we keep, we keep adding to the number of amendments that need to be worked on, is all I'm saying. But by the end of month, May, will even model budget increases be passed through? So the goal is to, is to get that backlog cleared by May. Including the model budget? Well, there are, again, there are, mo there are model budget discussions going on with agencies and vendors right now. Um, and so to the extent that those negotiations are ongoing, it's a just sort of a, a combined responsibility to bring that to Is a close. Is there anyone tracking this? So could you actually provide for the committee, um, and this is not make work, so if it's make work, don't do it. But, you know, we've gone back, and the committee has gone back and looked at um, all the right-sizing money and what was put into the budget for what years um, which is why I think the total is around 150 million for net net all four things. M maybe the total is different. I'd love to hear about that. Sure. And I'd love to hear about what percentage, even if we could even say in May. So by the time of adoption, could we know what has flowed through to agencies and how much you've had to roll over in order to make sure it happens next year. So the number is... is right, because it doesn't go away. If it hasn't been modified, the number doesn't, the dollar value doesn't go away, right? It's still going to get, it's again, just a timing problem over the years. So the investment in the nonprofit sector in this administration is 600 million, roughly. Um, and we are working on all of the amendments to those contracts to push that, that money into uh, providers' budgets. Um, we, uh, the vast majority are complete, um, and there's a, a final set that we're looking to push through and surge through to the end of May. So if we were to take out the 40 million for model budgets and only talk about indirect minimum wage and COLAs, yeah. Do you think we're done there? Well, it's so it's difficult to parse it out because uh, because amendments, uh, you know, aren't where we they're not as fast as we like them to be, right? We've all acknowledged will passport that. Passport fix amendments. So it will it will manage uh, amending a contract in a far more efficient way. How much time do you think it'll decrease um, getting an amendment through to a provider? So Will it be a change? I love the way you've spoken about, well, we've gone from a matter of months yeah, to a matter totally of weeks. Totally fair. Yeah, it, it's, tough, it's tough to know what the exact uh, day figure is now. I mean, we're thinking a lot about what those cycle times ought to be and what we should work towards. Um, we know that they will be faster because I think the transparency that we have in release one has played itself out in those, in those uh, figures that I've already cited, right? You have a process that is well laid out is transparent to both sides, city and vendors, right? Those things create speed just uh, uh, on their own. Um, That's the 90 million in procurement savings. <laughs> but, it, and so we're, we're trying to, we're trying our best to get these amendments pushed through as quickly as we possibly can. But in terms of, so agencies will at times, in, a, in an attempt to save time, and get the money out the door as quickly as possible. Also combine things, Sure. right? They'll combine the indirect with the COLA, sure. with the wage Great. adjustment into one amendment and push it through. So it's very difficult to parse out in the current state of play with the systems that we currently have to be able to parse out for you exactly what you're asking, which is how much of this and how much of that and how much of the other. Have you from found a, from that those things go through faster? Have you encouraged other agencies to put them through in whole? You don't have to answer it, but okay. it just strikes me that I hope through Passport, I think I hear you saying, correct me if I'm wrong, that when you have full implementation of Passport, that change orders will go faster and amendments will go faster. For sure. 
Okay, last just is a comment that um, if you could just let Ryan Murray know that he was missed. Oh, I, I will let him know. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. He would love to hear that. I'm sure he's so watching at home. Yeah, he's watching. Um, <laughs> uh, I wanted to, to keep digging into the, the late payment stuff. Um, during a recent hearing, uh, I think our last hearing, we did an oversight hearing for Passport, um, Mox expressed that the controller had not shared data with Mox uh, used for the report on late payments to the human service providers, and that many of the contracts used for the report may have been uh, council discretionary contracts. Um, a couple of things. Ha number one, has Mox received that data from the controller yet? If so, has your opinion changed on the issue of late payments to human service providers? If not, uh, how can we help you in, in securing this data request? So uh, our position has never changed. We, we, we've always known and didn't need the controller to tell us that there was a problem in the procurement process and that nonprofits experience that as much as anyone in, in, in New York City, and we're focused on that. Yeah. Um, the data for that original report, no, never came through. But we're really not interested in it, honestly. Um, the, the position that we acknowledge is that the procurement process is broken. It requires a, a significant uh, reform effort, which, which is underway. Um, and so, it, it, frankly, if we focused on the way the controller counts, you know, we could, we could spin our wheels in that space, but we're really uh, not interested in doing that. We want to implement Passport and fix this problem. Um, let's see. For the, the Compass RFP, there was a, um, the youth service uh, preliminary budget hearing. Um, I saw that Commissioner Chong told uh, Debbie Rose, the chair, De chair Rose, that Mox was taking the lead on negotiations with human service providers regarding uh, the rescinded Compass RFP. Um, why was the RFP rescinded and, and, and how is uh, the process going and, and how do you plan on involving the council in that? So um, historically, human services are, are budgeted, and, and, and DYCD in particular, on a standard rate. And so what we don't have currently um, for Compass or Sonic are providers submitting their own price um, for the services that they would provide. They're not competing on that price. They're not, we're not interested in having them compete on price and haven't been for a long time. And so what we've come up with uh, historically is a standard rate by which we will pay them. And so you have 100 kids in your after school program, 100 kids times the rate is, is your annual budget, essentially. Um, well, all of the investments in cost of living adjustments and increasing the minimum wage, right, those are now unique to each vendor, to each contract. If you're staffed with five folks in your program and another program is staffed with 10 folks, right, the cost of living adjustments and the wage adjustments are gonna impact those two vendors differently, right? And so now what started as a standard rate now is a variable rate. And so when we let the RFP, we came through with, a, with a, a, a new rate, a higher rate, um, but hearing uh, feedback from vendors, um, we, we decided that it required a bit more conversation to make sure that they understood this dynamic. Um, and so we're in the process of doing that. We've met with um, vendors who uh, were, uh, you know, Expressed an impact, expressed the impact to us on on what the the new Compass RFP model would be. We've also met with uh, a, a group of vendors who do not currently have Compass and Sonic contracts, and their reaction to rescinding the RFP. Um, discussions are ongoing, and we're you know we don't have a, uh, a final timeline on when this uh, new RFP will go out. Um, but we've extended the contracts, the current contracts, uh, through uh, the following year to ensure continuity of uh, services. Okay. And, uh, uh, sorry, uh, and your final question, happy to involve the council in, 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 the, uh, in, 
discussions about the issues that we're facing. This is not just this one RFP, right? You have lots of programs that are based, that are budgeted based on a rate. We, you know, raising the minimum wage and COLAs has thrown all of those standard rates into variables, and we have to figure out how to, how to deal with that. Um, it's not just a, a, a problem unique to this one RFP. Yeah. Um, just jumping around here to the, some of the, the other controller stuff. What, what causes contract delays af after a contract is registered by the controller? Where, where, where are the pitfalls there? Why does it, what could delay it from there? Well, once the contract is registered, it's registered. I presume you're talking about invoice and payment at that point. Um, if we're talking strictly about human services and nonprofits, um, then we are seeing a six day median cycle time on invoice approval by and large. There isn't a lot of back and forth. Having a standard budget and accelerator has lent itself to a fairly simple invoicing process. You establish upfront what your budgeted lines are and an invoice essentially debiting off of those lines. Um, we understood that there was some issues around budget modifications when you wanna change those lines and so we, uh, we put in a new policy where up to 10% of the budget can be modded without agency uh, approval, right? And so we've given the vendor, the provider some freedom there to mod their budget. Um, but the invoicing process itself uh, moves very quickly by and large. And is there a, a step along the way that vendors are contacted to, d to discuss the reason for contract delays? Sorry, could you restate like, that? In, I'm trying to get to, I'm talking all about after the after a contract is registered by the controller, yep. when in the process are vendors contacted to discuss the reason for the delays, if there are delays? So in, if, like is there something that, you know, when it gets to this point, we gotta call these guys and let them know what's going on? So I would say that to the extent, uh, agencies and, and, and providers are in contact all the time um, to the extent that they don't understand what the delay is, we've encouraged them to reach out directly to MOX so that we can get answers for them. But again, um, the goal, of one of the goals of Passport is to have a system where there is no mystery about where something is, what step it's on, what's next, and what to anticipate. So are there things outside, are there additional steps outside of Passport um, whether it's through MOX or the, or the procurement policy board, you know, are, there other, are there other ways to expedite payments to small vendors or uh, is, I mean, I know you don't like saying Passport is the panacea, but what else are we doing? So, so we're focused on a few things. So one is for sure Passport and having a, a, a transparent process throughout. But there are, you know, that doesn't have, you know, it doesn't help a, a vendor who has a late contract right now um, that a year from now we'll have passport. Totally recognize that. Um, and so we are, we've created uh, some mechanisms where we are uh, working with agencies to ensure that things, so the backlog is one, is one area where we're, we're, we're pushing agencies. We also created a policy on how to manage renewals and extensions. So a contract is either gonna be extended or renewed this coming July 1st. Putting, to, putting together a project management plan for them so that there are certain milestones that they must meet six and seven months out instead of, you know, uh, based on just the over, overwhelming amount of work folks have, you know, not realizing that they have a renewal, you know, two months before it's actually renewed. Just making sure that we're hitting those milestones well in advance so that we can hit July 1st. Those are sort of the interim things that we're focused on. Right. But you know, again, there ought to be a system that pings us six months out saying, hey, this contract has a renewal term in it, are you going to renew? And then that, you know, that process can be kicked off. We need, we need uh, to take some of the human element out of it and automate the things based on the data that we have. I guess I, I'm just trying to sort of, as much as we don't like to say that Passport is gonna be the silver bullet, I'm worried that after we spend $45 million, if, there, if a lot of these problems um, still persist, people are gonna, no matter what we, you, you say, that, it, that it's not a panacea, people are gonna say, I thought this was gonna fix everything, 
and we're still having the same problems as we had before. So I think that's why now, before it's fully baked, we're trying to make sure that you know there are other things in place to mitigate this stuff. Yeah, and so I would love to have a full briefing with the committee yeah. on where we're at okay. um, uh, from a, a design point of view and would love to hear more feedback that you guys have. Um, we're thinking about those things all the time. It freaks us out, you know? I mean, we're, we're a paranoid group. We want this to be like, a to success. Be clear, I, don't wa I, don't want it, I don't want that to happen. Of I course. want it to work and of course. It's everyone says this is great and everyone yeah. is, you know. I mean, look, so th the confidence that we have is based on some of the little things that we've seen uh, improve with the, the pieces of the system that are live, right? right? And so even in release one, we've seen, you know, the having the, the huge manual paper Vendex process put online, things are much easier now for vendors to be able to uh, uh, disclose their information and maintain it over time. The responsibility determination, which is like a background check on a vendor, has gone from, we think, six, seven weeks, but it's now taking seven days. So those little things, and there wasn't, we didn't have some, you know, hey, we have to get to seven days on responsibility determinations. This has happened organically because the process is transparent. We have vendor, uh, agencies sharing information on vendors, um, and so things are able to move much quicker. Um, and those principles are what we're putting into every piece of the system design. Um, but again, I would love the opportunity to sit with you all and go through this in a more detailed no, that, I way. I think that would be helpful. Great. Um, I have one other thing, and then I'm going to turn it back to uh, my colleagues. Does, does Mox have a sense of how much uh, the preliminary 2020 budget is funded through federal, state, and city dollars? Are you referring to Mox's budget? Or, yeah. Uh, we have no federal. Or citywide. The citywide contract budget. Yeah, we're not prepared with that information. Okay. I'd be very interested to know. Okay. I know, what? Well, yeah, I agree you should have that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, in, in previous budget hearings, I know Mox has agreed to work with OMB to provide a funding breakdown, so that's something we'd definitely be interested in. Sure, about. we can talk to OMB about a breakdown of okay. uh, citywide. Uh, Councilwoman. Oh, I, sorry, if I could just follow up on that, and I, you know, what do I know? But what's the total size of the contracts? How, how much money in contracts goes through the city? What's the total size by the end of the year? So it, the last fiscal year, I believe, was $21.7 in procurement. And so in the last fiscal year of $21.7 how much was funded through federal money yeah, we we or can come back. We can come. We funds? can come back with that precise breakdown. Happy to do that. I think the reason it's important is because, um, like one thing that that I've talked about before, is that it's challenging for the city for nonprofits when the city includes increases for minimum wage or increases for colas, and the state does not provide those increases, and I, I think that's part of what that question gets to. So if by the end of all our questioning your staff has it and you could mention it, that would be great. Um, I wanted to ask just a few questions. Um, um, in, as part of the indirect uh, costs, is there a standard now for indirect costs for all the providers? So we have a basic way to think about it is that we have a floor of 10%. Um, and the new cost manual uh, that we just issued um, right. provides uh, uh, vendors with greater flexibility. So essentially, if they have an established federal indirect rate, they can use that rate. Um, or they could have a CPA certify what their indirect rate is, and then they can use that rate. And when will that guideline or the manual go into effect? Is it in effect now? It's so it's it's meant to be in effect for fiscal year 20. For fiscal for, year for this 20. coming July. So yeah. it would start this coming July, and nonprofits know that they're are they now working with their CPAs. To, to the extent that they don't already have an established rate, yes, they can do that. Do you know how many already have an established rate? 
I'm sorry, say that again? Do you know how many already have an established rate? The number of nonprofits that have, we don't have, uh, we haven't surveyed uh, providers to know, you know who has one and who doesn't. We don't have that information. Okay, what's the total number of providers that you're dealing with? Uh, so it, it fluctuates, but typically anywhere from eight to 1,200 vendors have contracts. This is not counting city council discretionary vendors. That sure. number goes up, but the typical competitive contracts, it's about anywhere from eight to 1,200. Eight to 1,200. And um, so does the budget contemplate the cost of the difference between the CPA certified indirect and the baseline of 10 percent. So the cost manual, the goal for MOX and the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee was to issue a cost manual that gives uh, nonprofits greater flexibility in how they use their indirect rate, their established indirect rate. How they use it. So. So the, the rate that they have, they are able to use. What we're, what we're providing is greater flexibility to use an established indirect rate that they may have. So either their federal rate, a CPA established rate, or a floor of 10%. Oh, so does that mean that currently, if they have a 10% rate, and I'm totally making this up, let's say the federal indirect rate is 17%, and let's say the CPA rate is 15 percent what happens now that you have the indirect manual so we wouldn't contemplate that entire scenario right so if they have an established federal indirect rate of 17 percent then they can apply a 17 percent indirect rate on their contracts if they don't have a federally uh, established indirect rate they oh, can oh. like so they don't have a rate established at all they can go to a CPA firm, have them certify what Got their it. indirect rate is, and then use that. So let me say it a different way. I think I'm, I'm getting there. So let's say the current rate is 10%, and let's say a CPA says the right number is 20%. If that's the case, is the next step you look at their contract, and the contract includes an indirect rate of 10%, and if you leave the staffing and the OTPS as it is currently, because that's the contract size, we've established that is the right sized number, but now we're gonna apply the CPA identified 20%, that would therefore show that they can't fund the right sized contract, right? You have 20 workers and you have $20 in OTPS, and that equals $100. It used to be that the contract would pay for $110 because it was agreed that 10% is the right indirect, and now we know the indirect is, the proper indirect is 20%, so where does that $10 happen? Does that mean you cut it out of services by $10? Because now the agency can use that $20 for the indirect? Or does it mean that, therefore, in, in order not to lose services, the city makes up that additional $10? Does that make English sense? I do. I, I understand what you're saying. Um, the investment that the city made was bringing uh, folks up to a floor of 10%. Um, and in addition, this cost manual gives them greater flexibility within their budgeted lines to accommodate an established indirect rate. But wouldn't that, by definition, cut services? Not necessarily. Um, I, un I understand, I, I, I'm not ignorant to uh, nonprofit's position on this issue, um, but uh, our focus with the, with the cost manual was to give uh, providers greater flexibility in their budgeting and allow them to use an established indirect rate. Because before, I, let's not keep talking, but I, just in, for the purpose of planning, I would, I, I under, I'm not ignorant to what you're saying either, so I really understand the notion of flexibility. It would strike me that um, a, a budget would want to contemplate the impact of that. Um, 
what are the ramifications of allowing that flexibility? Perhaps bringing that up for another budget, but if, if, if your folks in talking to City Hall about the outcome of this hearing could mention that the City Council has now flagged that the obvious next step to that is an increase in money to the nonprofit providers. Happy to bring that back. Thank you, I appreciate that. You mentioned modifications, sorry, now I'm just gonna jump all over the place. These were sure. questions raised from your conversations with the chair. Um, you mentioned opportunities for modifications without approval. Could you just explain that a little bit more? Sure, so traditionally um, a, a vendor uh, a provider would establish their line item budget with an agency. And in order to change those line items, so from PS to OTPS, oh, I see. pencils to pens. Fine. We, so not a change in dollar amount, just a, not change, a change in a use. A modification with a, a net. Neutral. Yikes, that used to have to go through like the CP approval process? Uh, no, I mean, this is, this is expense, uh, expense funding uh, okay. by and large. But. Got it. Um, I'm wondering about requirements, contracts, getting back to the issue of different agencies do different micro things better. Um, if you are able to identify if requirements, contracts, for example, go better you know, at some agencies, could you use those same requirements, contracts for other agencies? So, uh, Requirements contracts generally do go quicker because you've established a, uh, a contract uh, and you say that when we, the city needs a particular thing, it's going to that vendor on that contract to make that purchase. So those things certainly move quicker. It had its own challenges, um, which is why uh, release two of Passport is, is meant to tackle uh, a lot of that with DCAS uh, and do it and managing those requirements contracts so that we can make purchases off of those contracts much more efficiently. And so for requirements contracts, are those 100% supplies and consultants, or could you also have a, like an MWBE electrician? So by and large, they're goods contracts. Um, if we're talking about professional services, um, MWBEs uh, for sure are, you know, raising the discretionary threshold to 150,000 um, has been a huge uh, uh, benefit to uh, the agency's ability to be um, uh, to, to move the needle on MWBEs in particular. Um, as you may know, the mayor came out last week um, and uh, made a proposal that that uh, dollar amount get raised to a million dollars, and we'd love the council support in having the state. That's happening make in that Albany change. right now. Yes. And is that part of the budget negotiation, or would it be independent of that? Uh, so it, it, th that's a better question for uh, Sorry about City that. Hall and, and OMB, but um, you know, the proposal to raise that to a million dollars would have a huge impact on our ability to close the disparity on yeah. for MWBs. Can I ask you, the M, could you refresh um, the public's memory of what the MWBE goal is for the mayor? So there's two goals. One is the, our uh, utilization the goal of, thir of 30 percent. Uh, the dollar amount is a one NYC goal, um, and that is 20 billion by 2025. And does that include the non-mayoral agencies? I'm sorry. Does that include the non-mayoral agencies? The one NYC does, yes. Local law, local law one applies to only mayoral agencies. Yes. And those under local law one, the one NYC is, uh, is a, a data set that we collect on not only mayorals, but non-mayoral agencies as well. So you're able to collect the data for MWBE contracts in the non-mayorals? Yes. Does that, could we use that as a door to walk through for not putting non-mayorals into passport? I, so the, I, I don't see a direct connection there, but um, again, we're, we're happy to talk to anyone that would benefit from an e-procurement system. Um, I would just caution that, you know, taking on uh, the, the breadth of something like 
NYCHA or SEA in the procurement process when we already have got established scope and plenty to do in order to go live with release three, we, sh we need to bite off what we can chew at this very moment. I don't disagree. It strikes me that some of the non-mayorals would have the capacity to figure it out themselves so that they could address your capacity issue. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of EDC. So EDC is a, a unique example. They're, they're, you know, uh, they're funded through a contract with SBS, as you know. Um, and so they are, it, to some degree, included in Passport. They, they use uh, Passport Release 1 now. Um, in some instances, they're users of the system. Um, and so they oh. are incorporated uh, into, into what we do. Whether or not we tackle every piece of their procurement process remains to be seen. Um, but uh, they, you know, we, we, we meet with SBS and EDC on, on some of these matters uh, uh, fairly regularly. And so a yellow flag if you're still using the flag system, which I hope you are, uh, from EDC could be used for DDC and vice versa. On a particular, you mean on a, a flag on a vendor? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. How's that going? With the flag system. Uh, it's, uh, it's, well, that's, so that's the seven weeks down to seven days, um, that responsibility determination. Part of that is uh, gathering that information about vendors and highlighting for agencies across agencies. Everyone's looking at the same information um, uh, on, on based on what we collect um, and any cautions that arise. And so uh, we think the process is, is going fairly well. Okay, thank you so much, appreciate it. Thank you for your time, Chair, and your time. Um, Councilor Perkins, you have anything? Okay, uh, just a couple of last things. Um, on construction contract compliance uh, with ADA, uh, what c what requirements are included in in uh, the uh, construction contracts related to ADA? Are there things baked in? I hope, assume. I, I'd have to go back and, and look at that for you, um, and, and can come back with more. Because I'd like, I mean, I I need to know how Mox is making sure that all construction contracts are in compliance with ADA, and if there's you know, how do agencies monitor and make sure that projects comply? Is there a punch list? That kind of thing. It's very important. Okay. We can come back with more details then. Otherwise, I think we're good. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, right on. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to hear from our first panel. Uh, Beth Goldman, Michelle Jackson, and Dana from Good Shepherd. And Andrea from Live On, please. I just want to, for the record, uh, say we were joined as well by Councilwoman Inez Barron. Um, I got the dream team here. Uh, cool. Whenever you guys, whenever you guys are ready, whatever order you want to go in. <laughs> I'll kick things off. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Michelle Jackson. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for the Human Services Council. Thank you so much for providing me for this opportunity to testify um, and for holding this hearing today on contracts, a really important issue for the nonprofit sector. HSC is a membership organization. We represent about 170 human services organizations in New York City, and procurement is one of our uh, focus areas. So this is a sexy topic for us, <laughs> as you know. So, <laughs> so I'm going to lay out a couple of, of issues um, that the nonprofit 
sector is experiencing. I could probably write the same testimony for the last number of years, um, but I try to give it a little bit of a different flavor this year. So the first thing, um, the sector is united across coalitions and providers this year in asking for an increase in, the, for the council to include in their response to the mayor and ask for $250 million for the implementation of the indirect manual. The Nonprofit Resiliency Committee spent a considerable amount of time developing the indirect manual. We think it's an important step in standardizing rates across agencies. Um, and there is a opportunity here for providers to be able to actually put their real costs into some of these contracts. Unfortunately, without any way of increased funding and the manual says you can't decrease services and more funding may not be available. Um, to be honest, it's like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Um, we are also often asked to take on unfunded mandates, whether it's the exempt employee overtime issue or just increased service deliverables. There's no cost escalators in our contracts. And so being able to say, I now have a 16% indirect rate instead of a 10%, but there's no space for me to claim it. Yes, it does allow flexibility if you have some money left over at the end of the year, if you have a staff vacancy, but we really need to be paying the full cost of these contracts. And that requires an infusion of cash, and the city should be paying the full cost of the services that they want nonprofits to provide. So that is a big area for us to focus on this year. The second, around contracting delays, the ever-increasing contract delays, uh, we are happy that the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee has undertaken um, renewals and extensions, trying to push those through earlier. So we think there's, we're re very optimistic about that process this year and can come back to you next year to say if my optimism was warranted. <laughs> um, but we do think that there has been a dedicated amount of resources from MOX and from the city agencies to clear up some of the backlog, um, at least in re the renewal and uh, place. But I, I mean, I'm sure you're here from a lot of providers after this about the money that they're still owed um, from contract delays and contract uh, registration or amendment delays that are currently going on. Um, and we, of course, because of this, while we think Passport will help, account of it, you know, being able to see where everything is is great, but who's pushing it along is really important. And so we support Councilmember Brandon, your bills around interest and, and accountability around the contracting process. And then finally, in the area of RFPs, uh, we think the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee has done, of course, incredible work around the collaborative program design. And over the last couple of years, RFPs have been focused in mocks, like they've been kind of taken over some responsibility for ensuring RFPs are coming out consistently. Unfortunately, we're not seeing kind of some of the values that are being purported in the NRC in those RFPs. RFPs are still coming out with very short time delay, uh, time turnarounds, like four to six weeks, which does not allow providers a real opportunity to respond. We're also seeing RFPs like the Compass and Sonic RFP when it came out that had rates that were pre-COLA and pre-indirect um, and did not, even without that, did not cover the real costs of those programs. So there's still not that collaboration. So we'd like to see MOX have dedicated resources to be able to really make sure that when RFPs coming out are coming out that the city agencies have worked with people who hold those contracts so that the real costs and real deliverables are put in the RFP and we don't have to do our advocacy around getting those pulled and delayed, which doesn't help communities um, and it doesn't help the city agencies get the work done that they need to get done. So I'll stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions now or after the panel. Good morning, um, Chair Britter, Council members. My name is Beth Goldman. I'm the president of the New York Legal Assistance Group. Um, I'm going to put aside uh, my written testimony, which you can review, and I really want to focus on delays. Um, I have testified before this committee uh, in the fall. I've been to the Charter Revision Commission, um, and as the president of an organization, I've devoted a lot of time to this issue because for us, delays in payments really are um, uh, a key problem for us as an organization and a major factor in thinking about uh, city contracting. So when I testified in the fall before the Contracts Committee, um, we had 3% of our FY19 contracts registered, um, and that was almost at the end of the first quarter of FY19. Now we're almost three quarters through, and we have 55% of our contracts. And that, by the way, um, accelerated a little bit. The last few months have been moving, and we're happy about that. But that's the reality, and that's been that way you know, every year. Um, and what I would say is we have very good relationships with people at the agencies we work with who try to help us through the process, who are getting, we get our invoices ready 
before the registration because they'll say to us, we're hearing, it's gonna move, get it ready, get it to us that day, we'll get it processed. And they do process it very quickly. So the issue is not the payment at the back end. Um, and it's not the relationship with the agencies who seem to be trying. They're certainly willing to share with us the information that they do have, but it's the delay in the registration. Um, and and what continues to be mystifying about it is that we have many, many contracts with many agencies over many years, but we're a known quantity, right? So what is happening through all that time? There are amendments, there are other things that need to get worked out between the parties to the contract, but most of that happens early on, and then we're, we're waiting in this um, little bit of a black hole. And one of the issues that I've talked about a lot is transparency, and maybe the passport system is gonna allow for that, but the reality is we don't know anything when we're sitting and waiting for registration. We can call some of our contacts and say, what are you hearing, what do you know, do you know where it is? Sometimes they can figure out some agencies better than others, but why we don't know where it is, what the holdup is, and it's usually nothing, right? It's not something that's held up the contract, it's just processing. So, you know, cash is a huge deal for nonprofits. Nonprofits have gone out of business because they didn't have cash. Cash is the issue that my board worries about, that I worry about, and so we are really excited about some of the proposals that um, Councilmember Brannon and, and Ravina have, have put together, but I just wanna say that if they don't get them registered, getting paid the interest that we, you know, that we have to borrow is great, but the reality is we can't make payroll, right? It's much more important for them to pay us on time than it is to get reimbursed for the interest. That's all. Roosevelt, you have a question? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay. I know the feeling. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. So good morning. Uh, my name is Dana Altnew. I'm the Assistant Director of Government Contracts at Good Shepherd Services, and I want to thank you all for holding this hearing this morning on a very important topic um, facing the nonprofit sector. Um, so I want to start off by first talking about um, a topic covered um, in delayed in registration. I'm happy to report that we just got our final contract in FY17 registered, so that was an exciting um, top piece, and we very much hope that the new passport system um, in version three will um, be transparent and help us understand the contracting process and delays. Um, some other issues I want to focus on are insufficient funding. Um, so as Michelle had mentioned, the, um, in the new indirect manual um, in which we'll, we'll be able to use our indirect rate, there are no increases to our contract. And so we are struggling at this point as we start to build our FY20 budgets, how to build them with our new indirect rate. Um, it's really hard when we're already doing the, you know, cutting corner, cutting, you know, OTPS and trips and all these other pieces to then say like, okay, now as a high school, in a high school program, you can't go on any college trips because we need to pay um, our indirect rate. So these are real conversations we're having at an agency level. Um, the other piece I want to touch on is um, the implementation of COLA and the indirect. Um, we have many contracts with the Department of Education who have yet to implement the COLA and indirect. Um, and so this year alone in FY19, we stand to lose $150,000 if that is not implemented. Um, those are programs, so we have community school programs during the day at some of our um, schools. And in the after school, um, we have contracts with UICD who's all their staff members get COLA increases, and so it would really not behoove us to have um, some staff get COLA increases and not others, and so we're left paying those increases. And so while the mayor has control of the DOE at the moment, we have yet to um, receive any of any of those increases. Um, so that that's the majority of what I wanted to say, so thank you so much for your time. Councilwoman allegedly has a question. <laughs> I've been down this road before. <laughs> I don't believe you. Thank you. Um, I, I misunder I'm not understanding something you're saying. If the contract, if the modification doesn't go through because it's delayed, it is my understanding that as soon as it does go through and is registered, you would get the full amount. It's simply a timing problem. Are you indicating that 
if it doesn't go through, say, between this fiscal year and next fiscal year, that you lose the money? No, we would receive the money if we actually got an amendment. So for, we have yet to receive from, is this, are you talking about the DOE contract? Mm -hmm. So for fiscal year 18, we've never received COLA and indirect amendments, and there has been no guarantee that we will. There hasn't been a decision through DOE that they will actually be doing the COLA. Sorry? There, DOE has not affirmed that they will be doing the COLA. And they DOE, did the, is this DOE yeah. education yeah, or health? Of education. But they did do the COLA in 2016. 2016. And so there's an assumption and that they should do it again. Um, and ob obviously as the mayor of control over those schools, like that's, I think that there's providers who did get that COLA in 2016, but are not getting this phase in of the three year COLA are waiting to find out. And if they don't get it, they have workers that they're going to have to give the increase to anyway, because they work right next to someone who does the same program through ACS or something similar. So the mayor's not announced that the COLA increase for other agencies and he's not put it in the budget? No. So we've been in contact with DOE and at this point we have not received confirmation that the COLA will happen. I'm sorry, which, you're with what organization? Oh, Good Shepherd. Do you have testimony? I do, I need to submit it afterwards. There's a minor error in it, so. <laughs> Good Shepherd, and I'm sorry, what do you do for education? Uh, we do a lot, we do LTW programs, learning to work programs, we have community school programs, so we do a whole variety of programs. Holy moly. <laughs> <laughs> Multi-millions in contracts, um, and we need to pay the increase in COLA. Okay, I'd be interested in your testimony. I mean, we'd be interested in your testimony and just to see how much money we're talking about also. Sure, so for fiscal year 19, it's around $150,000 that we would have to cover our costs. Just okay. in COLA. And was, did the city mandate that you put in the COLA? I they mean, don't, is this? But we, so we have workers, right, sitting next to, um, D, so for example, in some of our community schools, we have a community school portion and an after school portion. So they're paid for partly on, some of them on DOE budgets and some of them on DYCD budgets. So I see. it would be really hard to give worker A a COLA and not worker B. Gotcha, gotcha. By the way, do you have a different contract with DYCD than you do with DOE and it's the exact same service? It's for different services, but at the gotcha. same site. So people are working next to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, Chair. Go ahead, thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Andrea Chanfrani um, from Live On New York. Live On New York is a membership organization. We have about 100 members that are community-based organizations, nonprofits in your districts that serve seniors um, through senior centers, Norks, home delivered meals, um, senior services across the board, many contracted through the Department for the Aging. Thank you for having us here today. Um, I wanted to say something out loud that everybody in this room and everyone watching at home knows, but um, you know, the issue of city contracting and procurement is critically important, both to nonprofits um, as individual nonprofits, but to the sector as a whole. Um, you know, and I, and I just really wanna say that because I think the work that this committee has done at City Council, as well as the work through the Nonprofit Resilience Committee is really um, began to, to bring these issues forward and make um, some of these changes that will support the system because um, you know, the system needs um, to be sustainable for, for the work for the nonprofits that they're doing in the community to continue. So I just wanted to say that and acknowledge that um, there's a lot of technical changes that have come through and you know, they're not always as exciting, at least maybe not to Michelle <laughs> or to Michelle only, but um, they're really important. Um, you know, and so we just wanted to acknowledge that here and thank, thank you for your work. Um, I wanted to focus my testimony today in, in a couple different areas. Um, first, uh, Livon is a member of the Human Services Strategy Advancement Group. Um, as Michelle um, talked about, the, the budget asked this year to support the indirect manual and the indirect increases. We fully support that and echo all the concerns raised by my colleagues at the table um, to support the nonprofit infrastructure here in the city. Um, you know, we, we know that as a city, through all the contracts in the human service sector, we greatly value the expertise that nonprofits in our communities are offering on the front lines. These nonprofits very often have served their communities, built their communities over the past decades, um, and we're asking them to do really critical, important work through contracts. And, you know, but, you know, shouldn't we, you know, Councilman Rosenthal, you said something really um, important. I think you said life changes, scope changes, and we need to be able to do that. And don't we want nonprofits to be able to do that through the work they're doing? I think we do. I mean, I think in the senior um, aspect, we're talking about, you know, the largest increase in demographics in the next, um, 
couple decades and you know senior service providers really want to be focusing their time on how they're going to serve several um, generations of seniors through their work and instead they're they're looking at how to take out loans to meet payroll um, and how to you know shift budget lines around and that's not where you know their expertise should be spent so we really support these asks and support um, infrastructure for the service system um, the second I just really want to focus quickly on the entire DIFTA service system. Um, we talked about model budgets. Um, first was the model budget. There was $20 million total um, promised for the senior center model budgets. $10 million of that went to providers last year. There's a second 10 that is promised by FY21. Um, so that is not out yet and that is not put into budgets and we don't know when it will be. We are strongly advocating that go out this fiscal year, but we don't know when that will be. Um, that funding is directed only towards um, staff and programs. Um, I'll finish up quickly. A big part was missing, um, and that was to fund food and food costs and other senior service, senior center um, food costs. So we haven't asked this year to fund those food costs with a $20 million ask for the entire DIFTA system um, for congregate meals. Um, and just to close up, it's really important in the procurement sense, there's two very large citywide RFPs that are coming down um, the road in the next two years. One is for uh, neighborhood senior centers and one is for home delivered meals. So I just want to say that the sense of urgency is um, well passed because those will shape how we serve seniors for decades. Um, and so I just really thank you for, for paying close attention to the technical aspects of and the big aspects of this issue. So thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Thank you. Um, are you, if I'm adding the numbers correctly from Live On, mm -hmm. you're saying that the total cost, the need is $51 million. I just added up okay. all the numbers. So you're adding the, so the 20 million was for model budgets last no, year. No, no, no. Oh, you're adding, oh, for on our one pager. Well, so invest 20 million in senior center meals and kitchen yes. staff. That's one that's thing that's not funded. Correct, currently not, not funded. Not model budgeting. I'm gonna blip over the next sure. one, which is 10 million for promised. That's just timing. Perfect. So I'm gonna blip over it. Yes. Then plus 15, for home so delivery. that gets us to 35, plus 10 for repairs. Yes. That gets us to 45. Five for service coordinators. And that would be a new ask, yes. 50, yep. mm -hmm. and then one for case management. So Correct. that's 51. Yes. So you're saying that the 40 million that was put in the budget for model budgeting really could have been 91. Um, actually, there was only 20 million oh, so sorry. far put towards model budgeting. And that was um, put in last year. The first 10 million went out last what year. What happened to the other 20? Wasn't it 40 put in for model budgeting? I think maybe ACS, it went to ACS. ACS was, I think homeless ACS services. was the 40 million. The yeah. Because ACS had a set, and I think that was like 35 or 40. Got it, got yeah. it. All right, so it's 51 plus 21, 20. So the right number for model budgeting would have been 71 million. So point of clarification um, for model budgeting, the model budget process that began last year in the DIPTA system was focused on model senior center budgets. So the oh. model budget funding that went, right. so <laughs> it took us a while. I <laughs> for, it's, it's a game of semantics. Yes. The accurate increase for DIPTA should have been 71 million and it was 20. Well, I think we would actually probably argue it would be more. I think in the model senior senate, specifically taking out a piece of the DIFTA system, one piece of that, of one contract, one procurement is through neighborhood senior centers. So that is what the model budget process that started last year was focused on. Right. So 20 million was promised for senior, center, senior centers in DIFTA. 10 million of that went out to providers, which again, very appreciative, great first step, a lot left to be done. That second 10 million is promised by FY21. So that 20 million that's gone out, or that's promised so far for model budgeting is strictly for senior centers. Right. So there's a lot of other work to do within the DIFTA system that hasn't been addressed through model budgets. 51 million. I think, um, I think what the DIFTA and OMB are currently going through, which we're very appreciative of, is the um, steps in looking at the food system within um, senior centers. They kind of are looking at as a phase two, almost a model budget process for the food in senior centers. Right, um, but you're saying that's 20. 
Yes, that's the ask that we are pushing that we believe is um, will support the congregate meals as part of senior center. So if you look at it as a whole, that would be 20 million for senior center program and staffing plus 20 million more for food. And so let's put $40 million right. in the senior center. But if you would add 15 million for home deliver meals, yes. that's now a $35 million yes. Dollar ask. Yes. Okay. And that's outside the model budget process, because they're really looking through the model budget Get process. Get rid of the word model. I, yeah. That's fine. I was just going to say, the <laughs> model budget is a little bit of a misnomer uh, in, in the sense that, I mean, there were five or six, right. and they were all run very differently. Um, I would say the ACS one is probably the closest to an actual model budget process. And even then, like in some, in some of these cases, they backed into a number. They said, here's 20 million. How would you spend it? Or here's 10 million. Sure, sure. And so they did not in any way right size these contracts. None of them. Right None size of them is a better way. Yeah. So if we were right sizing DIFTA, we would add 51 million additional. Some of that goes to NYCHA for senior centers, but blurring over that. And probably more than that. And probably more than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the only reason I say it is because in our big ask to the city this year, you know, my goal is that that big ask is to right size our human service contracts. Mm -hmm. So now you're telling me 51 million would get there. If the number's bigger, you got it, now's the time <laughs> to say it's big, what is that dollar amount? But then, you know, in looking at all the other agencies, I mean, the sense I've gotten to is that in total, it's about 250 million. So I'm gonna take out 50 for aging and that leaves us 200 million for the, to right size all of the other eight nonprofits, and that might include indirect costs, it might include, you know, COLAs. Um, so when I think about the city council's big ask to city hall, I think it's 250 million to right size, and these are all component parts. Is that a fair? I think the number's low, unfortunately. I mean, I think when we looked at just the indirect rate part, which is totally advocacy math because only OMB, I mean, all of these contracts are very different. Like that alone is $250 million just to For kind of, in, indirect just, costs. Yeah, just if you were going to assume that most nonprofits have around a 15% indirect and some have higher, some have lower, you know, so if we took what the 100 million that was a 2% increase that the city, you know, OMB had decided a couple of years ago, just taking that number and assuming people, People yeah, on yeah. average need about five percent more. That's two hundred and fifty million. Because and so it would have been that's three. That's just the indirect side. Hang on, side. it would have been three hundred and fifty, but they funded a hundred million of it. So the right number more for indirect is another two fifty plus two fifty for indirect, and then plus fifty million to get aging up, right? And I can explain the advocacy math on that as well. Where we came, you know, it's it's okay. really, but it's really focused on the your, to your point of fully funding the contract. So for the congregate meals, for example, senior center meals, um, the current reimbursement rate is 20% below the national average. So that means the city is funding four out of every five meals that a senior center is serving. So what is the senior center doing? They're still going to serve the meals because that is what we do, but um, they're picking up the cost and they're losing money. Um, so that is where that those numbers for the 50 million for both, and that's the same um, with home delivered meals as well. So that's where that f that money comes up to. <clears throat> and I guess what I'm asking Good Shepherd and, and for all of you is to say, okay, so that gets us to 300 million. If we wanted to right size all of the human service contracts in the city, what would that number be? Yeah, I think we, A, we can ask the different coalitions what their asks are, and I mean, we have them and we can put that together. I think the other, you know, while this, a good problem to have, because we're having this conversation and this isn't a conversation we've had, is that all these contracts are uniquely underfunded and they've been underfunded for decades. And so I would say that Andrea's math, while good, is also inaccurate because these nonprofits, like, they have a austerity mentality. It's like Hunger Games out there. You know, like, they don't even know their real costs. And they're like, how much could we potentially get for adult literacy or senior centers or home delivered meal that like gets us the bare minimum? Um, to really actually right size is I think, a, a, it doesn't necessarily mean it's like you know, billions of dollars, but there's also, you know, I think how people, nonprofits like to spend money differently and things like that within programs. Yeah. And so I think there's two ways to do it. We can absolutely say what are the asks across the sector and get a number. And then I think there's a larger conversation around 
how do we engage with the city in a real model budget process to sit down with providers and say, this is what, what it really costs. And so, and from HSC's perspective, that's RFPs going forward. It's really hard to reset the past and like what's in process now, but the idea that there are a number of big RFPs coming up, like preventive services, um, in the senior, uh, in the DIFTA world, like there's all of these really big procurements coming up and the city should be engaging with providers now to say, what does it really cost to run these programs? And they are not doing that. There is not a survey, a real extensive survey of providers that says this is what it costs and here are the outcomes we really see and let's design a procurement that way. So instead of trying to backfill $500 million, like can we start with indirect funding? That's something we know. Can we make sure cost of living adjustments are something that are just baked into the contract as well as cost escalators and going forward let's make sure these RFPs don't c continue the same like underfunded like sure $2,500 per child how did we arrive at that rate I don't know we don't and when you break down the math none of our providers can do it that's the compass sonic like you know piece of it so that's a longer answer <laughs> no it's a it's the right um, answer I what I am frustrated with is you know, I think we've been asking this question um, since I was chair, and what's frustrating to me is just that the resiliency committee, I mean, all these different things that were set up, why are we still feeling that we're on round zero in figuring out that number? We share that frustration. Right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Appreciate it. Sorry, I remember my question. <laughs> That's how long it takes in the middle aged medal for women. And we're back. <laughs> so, and I also forgot to ask Mox about this, but one thing, one charter change that I think could be important is to award a portion that upon award of a contract, so we know it's going to you, solid. We just don't, we haven't finalized scope, price, indirect, whatever it is. Right now, there's, well, a couple things. First of all, do you have access to the returnable grant fund? Is there a um, culture of, oh, we can just get money from the returnable grant fund? That was what, uh, Dan implied. Is that true? So yes, nonprofits absolutely have access to the returnable grant fund. A number of our providers have used it over the years. I think in terms of it being a, a loan process is relatively simple. Um, you know, in terms of easy paperwork, I think the, the returnable grant staff are really helpful. Um, it doesn't cover all costs. Um, and so it really only covers payroll and a couple of other things. So you can't get like the full value of the money that you're owed in that returnable grant fund. And then we've seen, I mean, I have a provider who's owed $40 million. The returnable grant fund isn't that big. Um, so it has absolutely been tapped out. Um, nonprofits are not told no, but then, but they're also told like not right now, or you can have a portion of it. Um, and so while they have access to that grant fund, I would say it's, it's a Band-Aid that's now not even big enough to cover the gaping wounds um, <laughs> of some of these, you know, of, the, of how much money is owed to nonprofits. And then also it's like not the fix, right? It's- um, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so I think it, cause it's, again, it's another piece of paperwork for nonprofits to have to go through to access the returnable grant fund. And that's a really good point, that if the returnable grant fund says, here's the value of your contract, we're gonna give you, three quarters that value as a loan for th a quarter mm -hmm. of the year, that that doesn't do it. Right. Okay, and then secondly, would you have a sense of, could you think about uh, the timing between award of contract, start date of doing the work, and registration? Are you ever awarded the contract after you've started the work? No, that wouldn't be possible. Right, you would have to be Pretty awarded. <laughs> we, we, we've certainly had contracts that were awarded technically sort of after the start date, but then you work with the agency to, to kind of figure out what, how the money works and whether, because you haven't actually started on July 1, but it's a contract that runs from July 1 technically. And so you don't get the award until August 1? It's happened. Ouch. So one of the things I've been thinking about, although you're freaking me out, is that upon award, 
you would get a quarter value, full value advanced because at that point, it's simply a matter of timing. Is that fair? Either at the award date or the start date. I mean, you could see whichever one is right mm -hmm. earlier because it's at the start date that you need to pay. So that's what we care about. <clears throat> Are there ever times you mentioned that there's an abyss pre-registration when you know that you've solved all the issues of um, all, the, all the paperwork is in, blah, 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 but then there's this abyss between that and registration. Do you know whether or not it's gone to the controller? Um. We're, we're usually pretty sure it hasn't gone to the Has controller. Has not? Right, meaning the abyss means it's pre-controlled. Okay. Thank you very much for your testimony. I appreciate you. Thank you. Okay, we'll go further into the abyss now with Maria Lazardo, Chris Hanway, Tara Klein, and Carlin. Yeah, whoever wants to start. Thank you. Uh, good morning, um, and thank you so much for this opportunity. I am Maria Lizardo, the executive director of a settlement house called Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation, or NIMIC. We serve approximately 14,000 community members that reside in Upper Manhattan and in the Bronx. So this is like beating a drum over and over again. We are constantly under um, a lot of stress and really under duress because of late contract registration. And I just want to give you a little snapshot. We still have 10 out, uh, unregistered contracts, one from fiscal year 17, four from fiscal year 18, and five from fiscal year 19. The city owes us right now $997,202. That would cover three payrolls and one month of rent. We are currently behind two months on our rent and about to be three months as we enter April. Yes, it got so bad at one point that we were behind six months on our rent and we got an eviction notice. Had we been evicted, it would have been the most embarrassing thing because we were founded to prevent evictions. And yet, we cannot prevent our own eviction. Not because we don't have our documents in place, but because the city agencies delay the contract registration process, we keep submitting paperwork, workers' comp um, expires, another certificate, and on and on and on. So instead of spending our time thinking strategically about how do we move the organization forward, how do we improve the quality of our services, we are spending our time spinning our wheels, contacting agencies daily, where is our contract, because unless we contact them, they do not reach out to us to let us know where things stand. And over and over, this is the cycle. And it, we're at a point, this is a crisis in the nonprofit sector. Agencies have closed. I can think of one specifically in Washington Heights, Alianza Dominicana, that, that closed years ago because of this issue. And if we don't do something to fix it, many others will close. We have not missed payroll. We have been fortunate. But I know that I am. we are one of the the few select that have not missed payroll. I know of other colleagues that have missed payroll, and we cannot continue to function like this. Our staff dedicate their hearts and souls to serving the New Yorkers that are the most vulnerable, and they need to get paid on time. We need to pay our bills on time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I just ask, is anyone from the administration here? Or from Mox? No. From yeah. Mox. But no one from City Hall? Thank you. Hi, how are you? Uh, thank you for convening today's hearing. My name is Tara Klein. I'm a policy analyst with United Neighborhood Houses. We are a policy and social change organization representing 40 neighborhood settlement houses in New York City, as well as two in upstate New York. Um, actually, all of my colleagues at the table are members of UNH. Uh, so thank you again to Chair Brannon, Councilmember Rosenthal for uh, your attention to these issues impacting uh, the nonprofit human services sector. Uh, it's really essential that uh, in this year, in the budget, that the city recognize and address this large-scale underfunding of city contracts across the sector, which is calling into question the solvency of nonprofits and their ability to provide services to the most vulnerable New Yorkers. Um, 
I think it's important to mention from many of our programs perspectives, uh, their historic calculation with these contracts has been, even though they're underfunded, they'll find a way to make it work because they need to provide the services. Uh, but there's a growing recognition that there's increased risk with these contracts. Uh, and organizations are seriously considering whether they're going to continue bidding on many of these government contracts. And it's a very serious issue with sustainability of the sector. Um, so even though government contracts make up the majority of most of these nonprofits' budgets um, and in their contracts, uh, contracts only pay 80 cents on the dollar or less of the true cost of implementation of those programs. Um, I wanna echo a lot of what we've heard already from my colleagues in the last panel. Um, we uh, support the recommendations of the indirect manual as well as the $250 million uh, ad needed to fully cover its recommendations. Um, I want to briefly mention overtime exemption rules. Um, as you know, at the beginning of this year, the state raised the overtime exemption salary threshold from about $50,000 to $58,000 for businesses in New York City employing more than 11 people. Uh, and the intention was to make sure that employees are fairly compensated for their labor, but it really amounts to an unfunded mandate because we haven't seen any funding from the state for this. So we really urge the city to take action on this issue. Uh, next, I again wanna mention cost of living adjustments. Um, staff salaries in contract and nonprofit programs are chronically low, which is leading to low staff morale and ultimately high turnover that destabilizes programs. We're very grateful to the city that they've agreed to invest in COLAs, um, but unfortunately those COLAs are on top of historically stagnant, stagnant uh, salaries, so it really only works to recapture a small amount of um, what was lost to inflation over the years and doesn't allow salaries to be set at competitive rates. Uh, this is especially well illustrated in the salary disparities in early childhood education programs. Uh, teachers and staff in those uh, er community-based early childhood education programs are paid significantly less than their similarly qualified counterparts in public schools. These disparities lead to high turnover in those community-based programs. This turnover reduces program quality as it interrupts the consistent connection between a child and an adult that is essential to social emotional development. And it has also forced many programs to close classrooms and serve fewer children. Um, I also briefly want to mention the wage compression issue, uh, which is that though we're grateful, the city increased funding to bring uh, employees up to the minimum wage at the end of last year. The city hasn't addressed wage compression which is the need of organizations to increase the salaries of staff that are just above the $15 an hour uh, level, which contributes to low staff morale and high turnover again. Um, and finally, I just wanna echo again um, what we heard about timely contract registration. Um, we're glad to hear that the council and mocks are uh, focused on this. It's a really urgent issue. Um, and again, the, um, as uh, Livon mentioned, the senior center model budget issue is a very serious one and we would really like to see that promised $10 million this year. Uh, so thank you for your time. There's more in your testimony. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Carlin Cowan. I'm the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer of the Chinese American Planning Council, CPC. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today. CPC is the nation's largest Asian American social services agency working with over 60,000 Asian American, immigrant, and low-income New Yorkers in all five boroughs of New York City. We are proud members of UNH, HSC, and live on and want to support all of their asks today. I'm gonna to tell you about a few of the programs that we do at CAPC because we do a lot of them. We have an adult literacy program where we work to help people learn the English language and feel comfortable navigating schools, jobs, and public life. We have a great senior services program where we provide mental health, provide meals, and other important ones. And we have a, a program that's maybe a little less well known, but it's a pretty big program of ours, and that's subsidizing the city to carry out the services that they are mandated to provide. Now, since you might not know about this program, let me tell you about a few of the different activities that we do in this very important program of ours. We subsidize the gap between what the indirect rate of our contracts is paid out and what it should be at about a million dollars every year. We wait for late payments from the city while we're waiting for our contracts to be registered. Right now, the city owes us about a million dollars in late payments. It's another important activity. In this program, we also take out lines of credit while we're waiting for our contracts to be registered and paid out. This past year, we spent $157,000 in interest on those lines of credit, 
which the city won't reimburse with us. In this program, we also get paid actually less than 80 cents on the dollar to do our work. When I went to our chief program officer, he said, ha, 80 cents on the dollar would be great. It's more like 60. In this program, we also to provide additional services beyond that which we're actually contracted to provide. When we have seniors coming into our senior centers and that's their only guaranteed meal of the day, we're not looking at how many meals we're contracted for, we're providing those meals. And of course, external factors complicate this program for organizations like CPC and other Am Asian American organizations because despite the fact that Asian Americans represent 15% of the city's population, we receive less than 1.5% of the city's contract dollars. Now, while this program is expensive and large, I'm sad to report that the outcomes of it, unlike a lot of our other programs, have not been very successful. In fact, they really hurt our staff, our stability, and most importantly, the communities we serve. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today. Good afternoon, Chairperson Brannon and uh, other members and staff of the committee. My name is Chris Hanway, and I represent Jacob A. Reese Neighborhood Settlement, a 129-year-old community-based organization serving the children, youth, seniors, and families of Western Queens, many of whom are low-income and or immigrants, and the majority of whom are residents of public housing. I am here today to reiterate and support two key requests made by my colleagues in the human services sector that the Council A, allow no cuts to human services programs and indeed shore up our sector with an additional investment of $250 million for indirect. And two, mandate that the city clean up the backlog of all contract registrations and payments and ensure a transparent and timely registration system going forward. That's where I'm gonna leave the prepared remarks. You have the rest. Uh, Council Member Brannon, you may rep remember that I and uh, Maria here stood with you and the city controller uh, at a press conference where I laid out uh, a situation we were facing because of extremely late payments from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice on one of our Cure Violence pr programs that didn't even allow us, that A, caused us to come this close to missing payroll for the first time, and didn't even allow us to purchase uniforms for the Cure, Vi Cure Violence staff who were out, at the, out in the streets mediating conflicts, which made them hard to identify and made them susceptible to being shot either by perpetrators or accidentally by law enforcement. Um, because of the stink that we made, we got some funds from MockJ. But that was a short-term problem. Those, that was to pay back, that was to cover things that we had laid out cash for months and months ago. So we're back at the same situation. We seem to come closer and closer to missing payroll every single time. Um, and I don't know if folks really understand how serious it is. People say to me, well, don't you have a line of credit? Well, we're one of the ones who don't, and we're working on it. It's a long process. Um, and one of the challenges, one of the sticking points to us getting a line of credit is that we can't do an actual real cost and cash flow analysis because we get payments so late and in such a haphazard way that it's very, very hard to, to forecast that. Um, it's different every year based on where the city and state are. So that's another problem. I have stacks of bills, my fiscal team this high, deciding who to pay and who not to pay. We've lost three trusted consultants and subcontractors over the past two years. A beloved art teacher, a graphic artist who had been with us for years, and a martial arts teacher slash DJ. All things that you do a lot of in a community center. And the reason they left is they said, I love you, but I can't do this anymore. I have bills to pay. The folks on payroll, fortunately, although we've come close, they get paid twice a month. These folks get stuck at the bottom of the list because insurance has to be paid, bills that would cause us to close down have to be paid, and these folks are made to wait. How long can they wait? They finally say, I gotta go somewhere where they can pay me on time. So that's just an example about how this affects our ability to, to provide services, it affects the safety of our community, and it affects our fiscal health and the fiscal health of many of our colleagues. So thank you for listening. I know you've heard this before, but we, I'm trying to give some real, real life examples. I appreciate it. I mean, I think um, I certainly share your frustration. I mean, I know how long this entire sector has been dealing with this long before I even became an elected official. Um, I do feel like we're, we're getting a little traction now, at least they're paying attention. It's just a matter now of what they're gonna do about it. Um, it's nice to have 
people who sympathize or empathize, but we need action. Um, so uh, you guys are partners in this. So, um, and I think we've done a good job so far in, in the short time we've been working together, but we need to really uh, keep banging the drum on this. And, and all this stuff is very helpful as we, uh, as we head into the final. And, and council member, I just want to quickly join you in acknowledging the work that has been done by Mox and the team. I didn't mean to uh, not acknowledge it. The problem is it's like a race against time. Is it fast enough? And are the recommendations going to be turned into A, actionable policy, and B, funds to back it up? Because some of us are drowning. Right. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Okay, and with that, we are adjourned.